This algebraic geometry lecture will be about products of affine and projective varieties. So we will first do products of affine varieties, which is fairly easy. First of all, if you want to take the product of affine space a m times a to the n, this is pretty obviously just going to be affine space of dimension m plus n. We've got a pretty obvious map if you take, if you've got points x1 up to xm and points y1 up to yn. Um, this just gives you a vector x1 up to xm, y1 up to yn. Not very difficult. In terms of coordinate rings, you've got the coordinate ring here, which would be the ring of polynomials in m variables. And you've got a ring of polynomials in n variables. And the ring of polynomials of this affine space is just more or less the tensor product of these. So we've got k x1 up to xm tensored over k with k y1 up to yn, which is just more or less the ring of polynomials in all these variables. Um, if you're looking at algebraic sets, it's not much more difficult. So suppose we've got an algebraic set defined by an ideal i in this ring. And suppose we've got an algebraic set um, y defined by an ideal j. So let's call that algebraic set x. Then x times y is just the set of points divided by the, uh, well, well, the, the ideal generated by i and j in this product ring. So i and j are both ideals of this, and you can just take the ideal generated by them. So that's pretty straightforward. Now let's try the analog for projective space. So the first question is, what is the product of projective space of dimension m and n? If we can figure this out, then it's not too difficult to do the case of projective sets. Well, is it p m plus n? Let's try the first obvious guess. And the answer is no. The product isn't p m plus n. In fact, this isn't true even topologically. For instance, p one of r times p one of r at the reals um, is just a torus s one times s one. So it looks something like this. So it's a surface. On the other hand, P2 of R is non orientable. So I can't really draw it because non orientable surfaces don't fit in three space. So topologically, these are quite different things. Um, similarly, over the complex numbers, P1 of C times P1 of C is isomorphic to a product of S2 times S2. In particular, the second homology group is Z plus C, whereas P2 of C can be written as a union of a point plus a copy of C plus a copy of C squared in a nice way. And you can read off its homology from that. And its second homology group is just Z. Um, so, um, so, so P1, PM times PN and PM plus N are not the same. They're, they're still closely related. In particular, they're birational. So this contains a copy of AM times AN um, as an open subset. And this contains a copy of AM times AN as an open subset too. So these have dense open subsets that are isomorphic, which is more or less what is meant by birational. So they're similar, but not the same. Um, so let's try copying. So you remember we had a map here from AM times AN to AM plus N. What happens if we try and copy this for projective space? So we take X naught up to XM in projective space PM, and we take the point Y naught up to yn in pn, 
And let's try mapping this to x0, x1, up to xm, y0, up to yn. Well, if you think about it a few seconds, you'll realize this is a stupid thing to do because it's not well defined. The problem is that this um, has to be the same point if you multiply all the x's by a constant lambda. But if you multiply all these x's by lambda, it's not the same point in p, whatever this is, m plus n plus 1. So, so this construction just doesn't work at all. Cross it out. It's just a blunder. Um, well, the trouble was that the, these numbers were not homogeneous of the same degree in x. So these have degree 0 in x, and these have degree 1 in x. So in order to get a map from x, from the x's times y0 up to yn to something, we've got to arrange for everything to be of the same degree in x and y. Well, there's an obvious way to do this. We can just take x0, y0, um, x1, y0, xm, y0, and we just keep on going x1, y0, x1, y1, and so on, all the way up to x, m, y, n. And this now gives us a perfectly good map from projective space p, m times p, n to, well, there's a bit of a problem here because this is projective space of dimension p, m, n plus m plus n, which has completely the wrong dimension. So this map is certainly not on two. Um, so if we call this, well, well, it's not on to, um, it's a, we'll see in a moment that it's a closed subset. And to see it's a closed subset, we want to write down some relations between all these. So, so let's number these as what W naught naught, W one naught, and so on, W M naught, all the way up to W M N. I guess those should be colons, not, not commas. And now there are some obvious relations between all w i j's. So we've got w i j is equal to x i y j. So we see that w um, uh, w i j times w k l is equal to w i. And let me just get this right around. This is a bit confusing. Um, w i k times w j l. Um, wait a minute, I think I have got confused. Uh, let me see, w i j should be w i l, and that should be w k j. Incredibly easy to get muddled up about this. Um, yeah, okay, so, so we've got some relations between the WIJs. Um, um, so we would like to check this is on to. Um, before checking it's on to, um, let me just give a slightly more abstract way of defining this map. So, um, if you've got a point in k to the m plus 1, another point in k to the n plus 1, then you can get a point, so let's call this point v and this point w, then we get a po point v, v tensor of w in the space k m plus 1 tensor k n plus 1. So a point of projective space is defined by a non-zero vector in m plus one dimensional affine space. So v and w um, more or less represent points in projective space, if you think of a line spanned by v rather than w. So we can find a point in this space here, which represents a point in the corresponding projective space p m plus n plus p m n plus m plus n. And if you unravel everything, you find this map taking V and W to V tensor W is more or less just this map down here. So 
Uh, this is a sort of computational way of defining this map, and this is a more abstract way of defining the map. It's just a, um, taking a tensor product of vectors. Um, anyway, so, um, so we've got a map from Pm times Pn um, to some subset, and we would like to know, is this subset defined by all these equations here? Um, well, we want to show the map is on to. So we want to show the map from Pm times Pn to the vectors W0 opta WMN satisfying Wij W um, KL equals W I try and get it the right way around this time W I L W J W K J. Uh, yeah, it's still getting confused by this. Um, so uh, we want to show this as on to. So, so let's take a point like this. We can assume W naught naught equals one because one of these wi's must be non-zero and just by rearranging coordinates we may as well take it to be w naught naught then we find w k k l is equal to um w naught l times w k naught which is equal to y l times x k assuming we, we, we should write as y l times x k um so all these w k l's are determined by the numbers w naught l and w k naught and we can fix these to be anything we like by choosing the y's and the x's correctly we're assuming it's y naught equals x naught equals one of course so any um so any point satisfying these equations here is in the image of Pm times Pn. I should say this map um, is called the Segre embedding. Um, so we've managed to show that the product of two projective spaces is a projective variety given by a surprisingly large number of equations in a space of quite high dimension, but whatever, it works. Um, as I said, um, now, now that we've embedded product of projective space, it's really completely straightforward to show that the product of any two projective varieties is also a projective variety just by more or less copying the argument we did for affine spaces. Anyway, let's see what this map looks like in the, the simplest non-trivial case. So let's try and embed P1 times P1, see what happens. Um, well, here we've got points X0, um, X1, and here we've got a point Y0, Y1. Um, so we're going to map this to P3. So this is um, one times one plus one plus one. And we map these two points to the point x naught, y naught, x naught, y one, x one, y naught, x one, y one in P3. And if we call these numbers, let's call these numbers w naught, w one, w two, w three. We find there's only one, we only get one relation between these, which is W naught W3 equals W1 W2. So this is a quadric in P3. Um, now, if we're working over an algebraically closed field, Any two 
missing are isomorphic. It just means a quadratic, um, a homogeneous degree two polynomial, and saying it's non-singular means it essentially means it must use all the variables. And in fact, any two non-singular quadrics by completing the square or something from linear algebra um, must be just x naught squared plus x one squared plus plus x n squared equals zero. Possibly, let's say, algebraic closed field of characteristic not equal to two because things always go wrong in characteristic two, and I'm too lazy to think about what happens in this case. So um, we see um, over, again, over an algebraically closed field of characteristic not two, any quadric in P3 is isomorphic to P1 times P1. In particular, it's got two sets of lines on it because P1 times P1 obviously is two sets of lines. You can fix a point in this and then you get a lot of lines there or you can fix a point there and then you get a lot of lines in that one. For example, suppose we take a sphere, x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals one. So this is over the real numbers, this is just a sphere. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to claim that this sphere actually has two sets of straight lines on it. Um, that seems a little bit odd because a sphere in R3 obviously doesn't have any straight lines whatsoever on it. And I, I don't mean geodesics as in differential geometry, I mean actual straight lines. Well, it has lines over the complex numbers. Um, it doesn't have lines over the reals, of course. Um, for instance, I can give you one example of a line. There are a couple of, uh, there are a few lines that are easy to spot. We can just set um, x equals 1, y equals i times z. Um, this is obviously a straight line in the complex numbers because all the numbers are just linearly dependent on z, and it obviously satisfies this equation here. So I'm going to leave it as an exercise. Find um, all straight lines on the sphere x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1 over the complex numbers, of course. Um, might want to notice that this um, equation can be put into more or less the same form as this equation if we write it as x plus i y times x minus i y equals 1 minus c 1 plus c. So if we homogenize we would change these ones to some variable say w and then this would be something times something equals something times something which is up to a linear transformation the same as this equation here. Thank you.